Hey, it's Rich, and you're listening to the Mature Me Podcast, weekly content devoted to all things life, leadership, culture, and faith. Thank you for taking some time to tune in. Make sure you subscribe and follow us on all our social channels so you don't miss a thing. Let's listen to today's episode. Well, hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Mature Me. I'm so happy that you're joining us today. Wherever you're at in the world, let me just say it is a privilege. It is an honor to come into your airwaves. Maybe you're listening by way of podcast. Maybe you're watching by way of YouTube. What I would ask is why not consider liking this, uh, leaving a comment. Love hearing where you're from. Love getting your questions. We're going to try to start answering more of your questions as they continue to come in. But man, like it. Subscribe to it share it. It really, really helps us around here as you share the messaging. Also, one of the things that the team wanted me to bring you up to speed is is that every week uh, I release a a brand new email. It's called Leadership with Rich, and it's really easy to subscribe to that. It's free of charge. Every Tuesday morning, I think around 6 a.m., we uh, hit that right off the press. I think close to 6,000 people now are subscribed to that. We would love to give that to you free of charge. Check out my Instagram page. Go to the link there in the bio, and you can subscribe today. I think as leaders get better, well, we're all going to get better. But uh, on this podcast, we're always talking about maturing, not just growing old, but growing up. There's a big difference. We're all going to age in life. The question is, will you mature? I've learned in life that life's always changing. And there's always transitions, there's always twists, and there's always turns. But how you handle those transitions, how you handle those twists and turns, well, it makes all the difference. And today, I am joined by none other than my good friend, Dakota Duran is in the house. Dakota, how are you feeling? Feeling great. It's good to be back. Excited for the for the talk today. And uh, yeah, I, I love what you're talking about, the emails. Leadership with Rich, man. Let's I go. love getting those emails. We got to get better. Yeah. Been, how are you feeling? I feel good. As we always say, I'm about to be 40, you're about to be 30, and we are transitioning into, uh, well, you're becoming a man. Yeah. And uh, I'm becoming... 30 is the year that you become a man, right? Yeah, well, yeah. It's your ministry begins yeah. at least. Adam According to Jesus. 20, a boy, I, I don't know. <laughs> you're like, um, you're like uh, well, you're a man of God. That's all I'm going to say. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep it nice today. But today, it's not just me and Dakota in the studio. Friends, Go. we are so honored. Uh, I'm so excited about today's episode because uh, I'm bringing someone that I really admire, someone who's inspired me from afar. And the closer I get to him, the more and more I just enjoy him. We have none other than the legend himself. This is Trey Morning, friends. Thank you so much for having me, fellas. I How really you feeling, Trey? It. I am You excellent. came in, by the way, like... Dapper. This is, this is the maturity that... Dapper. Dakota, Dakota do you own a suit? What? No. Of course, no, why would of course I, why would not. I, why would I have that? No, I got a good not. tailor for you, man. Yeah, you look fire, bro. Thank you, bro. I appreciate it. How you feeling? I'm good. I'm good. I'm glad to be back in Miami. I was doing some traveling all last year, and one of my first stops every time I'm back is the... House of God on 40th Street in the Design District. So, so let's thank go. Thank you for having me. So this is, I am curious, this is a tailored, all your suits have to be tailored? Because you're, how tall are you? They have to be. I'm 6'9". Okay, so they don't, you can't just get that. No, you can't. At Bloomingdale's. You can't just get it at Bloomingdale's. Yeah. What, what size in Zara do you wear? Zara? I, you know, I did go into Zara. <laughs> I went to Georgetown and we have one right up the street. Really? I would oh, go with my man. friends. And I would try it on and just put my hands up when I. And it, it wouldn't work? It would be like Oh a, yeah, a there's top. no chance. It didn't work. They Any nice store stuff, where I can buy a suit, you can't buy a suit. I cannot, no. <laughs> you know? That's What's just a, a fact. What size shoe? Size 15. Wow. Yeah. So you have to get custom shoes? No. Mm. No, I, I don't have to get custom shoes yet, thank God. 15's usually there? 15, they have, depends on the store. Low stock. It depends on the store. Yeah. I, you got to find the right stores and you be consistent with it as an athlete. But in like sneaker drops and stuff like that. Yeah. You can, it's, it's harder for you, easier for you? You know, I got a guy. Oh, you got a plug. Okay. You got a plug. Got a plug. Got a but for the regular 15 footer, you know, yeah. <laughs> what, what is that? Is there more of an inventory or less of an inventory? There's just always been less of an inventory. Okay. So most sneaker stores stop at 14. I yep. used to go in and just ask if they had my size out of curiosity. Yep. Yeah. It's like, I don't want to buy anything. I just want to know if you got it. Do you got it? Yeah. I do get curious. You know? how, how often are you in a suit in the week? Four uh, days a week? Uh, you know, I got the Zoom Fit, too, which is just the pajama bottoms. Respect. And the, and the nice. Top. Respect. <laughs> Zoom Fit. Um, no, most days I'm in a suit. Uh, I'm one of the chaplains for the Miami Heat now, so I go to games dressed in suits, and my dad has worn a suit pretty much every day. And since since I was a kid, seeing him go to work since he's retired, yeah, I don't know how he does it in the summers. Summers um, in Miami. I There's something about putting a suit on as a man that just kind of makes yeah. you, like – 
I'm doing something. I, yeah. I, I dress for success. You, you know, feel, like feel productive. You Look feel good, feel good. The other day, whenever we, we launched the, the Miami Gardens location, you you for some reason had a sports coat. What was Absolutely, that about? Absolutely, because I'm a man of God. Yeah, yeah. it's just coming like, in, yo. Someone's got to lead just around something here. New. It's hey, like man. I'm gonna go for you, it. You got to show up. I had a friend that honestly used to tell me it was a preacher, and um, he didn't dress in suits much. But oftentimes when he would write his sermons, mm -hmm. he'd go put a sermon. He'd go put a suit on wow. and get in his office and then write. Yeah. And the whole concept was was like, yo, I'm doing business yeah. right now. Mm. I'm doing work right now, yeah. and I need to put a uniform on yeah. to trick my mind into going, what I'm doing right now is really yeah. important. Mm. We would do that in college, actually. So really? At Georgetown, we had a tradition that guys since John Thompson Jr.'s days, who was my dad's coach when he was at Georgetown, would wear a suit going to games. And JT3, his son, was my coach. So okay. it was this whole legacy mm. thing. And we wore suits to every single game. I love that. And I remember doing it in high school, too. Like, there were certain times where we had a special game. And I was yeah. like, you know, let me put this suit on. Had a nice little beret. To, not a beret, but like. A beret. Not a beret. One fedora. No. Nope. Is it a fedora? I don't know. Isn't it a fedora? I don't know I what I think it might He's... be a fedora. It's the one with the bill. Yeah, it's a it's fedora. Like a Isn't that a fedora? fedora. Does anyone no. know? I think yeah. it's a fedora. Like a fedora. Newsies hat, right? Yeah. Yes. Remember Newsies? Look at me. I'm the king of New York. It's Christian Bale, some of his earlier work. I didn't Missed see it? that one, no. Fantastic it film. Before my time. Really good yeah. film. Yeah. Well, you I know what Deion Batman, Sanders though. said? What did he say? You look good. You feel good. You feel good. You play good. Amen. There's a science to this. You play good. You get paid good. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. Here's a science. Amen. I am curious. He's, he wears a size 15. I wear a size 13. What size shoe are you? How do we get on this? Topic? I'm just curious. I don't know. I mean, my, my little brother, I feel wears, attacked, my little so brother, he's 14. He wears a size 16. So what size do you wear? I think that's around the size I am. No, I'm really nine and a half. <laughs> nine and a half. Nine and a half guy. I I like. So <clears throat> this is actually honestly funny. I actually prefer. I don't know if you ever had this thing, but like I always wanted my feet to be smaller. Even today, right now, I'm wearing an 11 mm -hmm. in an Air Force One. Because I feel like the silhouette just looks a little bit better with the pants. I don't know if this. Yeah. If, I don't know if anyone ever hits this. You don't like a Hobbit silhouette. <laughs> <laughs> you, don't say, you don't want like the clown feet well silhouette. no like i'm not gonna lie to you like bilbo baggins i think his whole aesthetic is Swag, fire yeah. okay i mean that now i don't go with like, it's a Mary, pentecostal vibe I'm not, no like shoes. A, I'm not like a pippin or like a samwise gamgee <laughs> guy but man right. we start talking frodo or bilbo i'm like dude this guy's got all these guys got a swag you right, know right, right. this is silly anyways Sorry. my foot is um i i, I prefer it small this is yeah, gonna yeah, go yeah, somewhere yeah. so you know i ran this marathon this past year and um Bro, like the first time I ran a half marathon, my my toes were black and blue afterwards. Oh, wow. Like just, and when when you like bruise your toe, it's like with you for like months. That nail yeah, has to fall off. So I was getting ready for the full marathon. I was like, I'm gonna go to the run shop and actually mm -hmm. just like for the first time have someone like yeah. you know evaluate my is it the gait like your running gait yeah, yeah, and how yeah, you run. Yeah. They put you on the treadmill. Yep. it's kind of a fun experience. Anyways, the lady's like, um, what size shoe are you? I was like, you know, 11, 11 and a half. She was like, well, let's measure you. I was like, ma'am, I'm 39 years of age. Like. I don't need you to measure my foot. You know, yeah. She's like, no, no, let's measure it. I'm like, okay. So she's kind of forced me to do it. So measure my foot. She goes, uh, you're a 12 and a half, wow. and we're going to put you in a 13. Wow. I've been wearing a, I have an 11 on right now. I ran the marathon in a 13. Wow. And it felt good. Uh, it changed everything. Like, it, it's, I mean, there's so much of a sermon in there. I don't I mean like right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> cramming your feet when it's like all you needed was a little more room, bro. Exactly. <laughs> all you needed was to breathe a little bit more. But wow, that's good. genuinely, I can't believe I even, I'm even saying a 13, but I think it's more for like athletics or for sports. Yeah. But like for you, if you're a 15, mm -hmm. and is that in basketball shoes too? When you play basketball, you, do that's you go bigger or? Too. So these are size 15. It depends on what type of shoes you get. But depending on certain teams I played for, we had to get taped. Okay. Right? And when you get taped, you have to go bigger or no? You have to go maybe a bit bigger depending on the shoe. Yeah. There's certain toe boxes that are smaller, like Kobe's, which I really like. I love wearing Kobe's, they have man. A really wide it's a mid, box. right? Like it's got yeah, a different heel. It's, it's like a low. They have some mids, some lows. But I love Kobe's. Wasn't that whole shoe, like, if I remember, like, sort of advanced or kind of like unconventional thinking from Kobe? Like, because yeah. everyone always thought you had a like, crazy ankle yeah, support. Your basketball shoe, so right? Kobe was so revolutionary. He, he grew up in Italy. So he watched soccer a whole lot. We actually support the same soccer yeah. team, AC Milan. And he noticed that, hey, soccer players are changing angles at such a quick pace, but they're not wearing these big, bulky boots like us basketball mm. players are wearing. They're wearing these low-top shoes. So he's the one that brought that low-top model wow. to basketball. And then it changed the game from there. More guys started wearing low-tops and making low-tops. And, and you wore those a lot like playing? I wore them when I was in the G League. I wore them sometimes. Kobe 4 is really good. Yep. Um, after he passed away, they stopped 
yeah. making them. Yep. Um, so they have some coming out now. I, believe. I just saw a post like on Hypebeast or something today that like Dodgers. Vanessa Bryant just put out some kind of like um, uh-huh. like a red wine looking version. I was mm-hmm. like, oh, I haven't seen Kobe's in because I, mean, I don't know if there was like something held up yeah, or yeah, I don't yeah. know all that. But a lot of it is legal. Like we'll, we'll talk about and we'll talk a lot about maturity today. But one of the things that I teach from as a life coach now. I talk to professional athletes and I help them see the game as a professional Mm. because there's so many different levels to it. And I grew up in this game and there's a business side to basketball that most people don't realize. The average NBA career is only three years. Jeez. So from there, if you're a millionaire at 22, 23 years old, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? What are you going to do with the rest of that money? How are you going to invest it? And uh, Vanessa Bryant, she's a great businesswoman and behind the scenes when it comes to releasing a shoe, it's not as simple as put the shoe out. Right. It's like, no, like, let's sign maybe a 10-year deal. Is this going to return money? It's obviously going to return money because it's Kobe, but, like, where's that money going to go? Yep. Is it all going to go to Nike? Very good. You know, is it going to go to me? You know, how, how's it going to work? What's the deal breakdown? What's the story behind what we're putting out the exactly. product? Why does it matter? Does anyone care? Is it resonating with someone? Exactly. It's all very, exactly. very interesting. Mm-hmm. I think it is important. We're so glad that you're on today. Thanks yeah, for coming thank on. We yeah. kind of just jumped in, which is sort of always the flow. But l- let's kind of maybe help people that are maybe just tuning in that don't know much about you right. or just new to you. Like Trey has got an incredible story, very interesting childhood, very interesting uh, career path. And the things you're doing today, I think, are really exciting. Also just uh, has had such a beautiful encounter with God and Um, I was actually trying to show this to Dakota. In fact, I saw this. I don't know if you've seen this, but this thing went like viral of you the other day. Bro, you got to tell me about, let me see if I can find this really quick. Maybe we can pull this up and post somehow. But this is the coolest thing. This is, and you're in a suit. Uh This is in our neighborhood, Coconut Grove. And this is, I want Dakota to see this, but you got to weigh in on this. This is, this is when, this is a life coach. I serve the children of NBA players. My father played in the NBA for 16 years. So Really? What's your father's name? His name's Alonzo Mourning. Interesting. So your father basically played the NBA, and how was it to be a son of an NBA player? It was fantastic. I absolutely loved it, and you know I'm really grateful for my parents. I lived a fantastic life, and I still do. And so the kids that you actually coach and help them, what are the challenges that they're going through as kids of NBA players? A lot of it has to do with identity. A lot of it has to do with realizing what it is that you have in your hands. I had somebody tell me once that my dad didn't introduce me to basketball. God introduced me to basketball. He just happened to use my dad to do it. So it's really a matter of reframing and seeing things through the lens of Christ. Um, Because as believers, we have the mind of Christ. So that's, that's, that's really what it's about. What could other parents do to make sure the children think the way you think? You know, the Bible says instruct your kids in the way to go. And when they get older, they won't turn from it. So at the end of the day, my life is my responsibility. And I get to a certain age when I'm making decisions for myself and then eventually my own family continue to walk in a way that honors the Lord and your kids are going to see that. Bro, you killed that thing, man. man. Let's go. What? Like, bro, that thing popped up or I guess my brother-in-law sent me that to me the other day. Uh He's like, bro, this is Trey. Yeah. What, what, what was that? Like, Hey, actually, you killed that man! Like you, man. Uh, that was like, like, like yeah. I could prepare my whole life and not have that good of answers. <laughs> like I'm like, how does this guy just got your suit up. on out in the streets? What was that? He just that? rocked man. up on you. Yeah, he was. You know, the camera guy is actually a guy who goes to Vu. Really? Yes. Like after Matthew, he serves on. Um, I forget his his last name, but like he's he's was behind the camera, so man in the dope. camera. I think he maybe. Yeah. What what were they? But they're just out there and just approached you. Just out there on the corner. I was walking across the street. I was actually going to meet uh, another friend from Vu, um, and uh, like, can we talk to you? Like, like, sure. Yo, we have a question. You're gonna help the kids. Let's talk about business. Very cool. And I was like, all right, cool. Let's do it. So I spoke, and man, it was just really, really natural. You know, I, I've prayed this prayer a whole lot, and say this is a mature prayer. It's like, God, when I get to where you have. For me, I don't want to be able to take any credit for it. Mm. And that's something that I'm not able to take credit for because, yeah. like you said, it went viral and a lot of people have come up to me, you know, whether I'm at a heat game or, you know, just walking down the street. And I'm like, yo, I saw your video. That really yep. impacted me. And I'm not able to take credit for it because I'm like, yo, I was just walking to go meet a friend. And God interrupted and he's like, yo, do this recording for a minute. And it's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. People go viral for a lot of things. Yeah. Usually it's not always for just the best truth. stuff. Yeah. But I'm like, man, every word you said just yeah. I think the video is kind of cool too, because I think it's a great way to kind of even begin. Maybe just like I think for everyone who's watching, listening, your story is quite unique and like Thank the you, way man. that you grew up. Maybe just tell us a little about growing up in Miami, yeah. who your dad is, where you went to school, playing ball, all that stuff. Yeah. yeah. So uh I was born in Washington, DC, actually. But as soon as I can get down on a plane, I, I came down to Miami and went to 
fast forward, I went to uh, Ransom Everglades High School. Okay. In Coconut. Oh, I didn't right know you went to Ransom. Street. Yeah, I went to Ransom. And, um, man, I've always known of Jesus, you know, praying before meals, praying before bed and all yeah. that. And my dad has a pretty wild testimony. Um, he, you know, was diagnosed with kidney disease after coming back from the Olympic Games in 2000. Wow. And um, was really gutted, you know. Uh, I was already born. I was four years old, and my sister was about to be born, and she has the last name Sydney because the games were in Sydney that wow. year. And we come back on this plane, and my dad starts the season shortly after that, and he's noticing that he's, like, really inflamed on the airplane. And when you would actually poke him, like, he retained so much water that, like, it would leave an indent in his skin. And he... Um, Gets all his routine physicals before the season starts. And your daughter's just born. You're coming back after winning a gold medal in the Olympics, and you're ready to crush it. You're ready to kill it. And he gets diagnosed with this kidney disease. And uh, from that point on, it was just, you know, really rooting himself again in his relationship with the Lord. My dad made a decision at 12 years old to go into foster care rather mm. than choose to live with either of his parents. Wow. And um, the foster woman he had, the foster mother he had, a uh, woman of God, you know, taught him how to navigate the Bible. Wow. And she's really the uh, linchpin, and I know I'm, I'm living as a result of some of her prayers today. Like, these, this conversation is an answered prayer of hers, and the work that I'm doing is an answered prayer of hers. So um, you preached a sermon before, prayers never die, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. yep. And uh, I think this is such a, a beautiful reminder, but, you know, fast forward, um, um, in college at this point and at Georgetown University and doing my professional thing. I end up going play in the G League, played overseas as what well. What position did you play uh, at Georgetown? I played mostly center, yeah. mostly center forward, actually out of position, you know. Really? In some ways, because um, I'm really a small forward, power forward yeah. in size, uh, but I was placed in that position and I was a – Was, was when Patrick saying, you and your coach? Patrick was my coach for some of the years, okay. and John Thompson III was my coach for, for three of the years. Patrick Union's like a, a hero at Georgetown, yeah, isn't he? Yeah, he's the best player in Georgetown's history. He used to always wear that Let's gray, go. like, Heather Gray shirt uh -huh, underneath it. Uh -huh, I should pull actually, up a little yeah, photo of that. Yeah, yeah. You should have uh, worn that as a tribute every once in a while. I did. You, you know, did? I didn't go. wear the Heather Gray one because, like, now we got dry fit. That was the 80s. Back yeah, then yeah. They didn't have all that stuff. But, um, yeah, man, I wore a shirt sometimes, and when I finally hit the gym, I'm like, you know what, I'm not going to do that no more. I'm what was your That's dream as a boy? Because your dad was always playing. Your dad played for the Hornets. Did he play for the Hornets back then? He played for the Hornets. That was the first team he played Ice for. Right there, That's what I remember. Okay. Was it like him and Larry so you Johnson on that stuff. team? Grandma, Ma, yeah. It was him and Larry Johnson. They Let's played go. together. Isn't that crazy? Um, I, yeah, the Hornets, man. It was nuts. Yeah. Like, I, I wasn't around. You then. weren't even around. I was around born then. in 96. And my dad got traded to the Heat in 96. Where's Larry Johnson? Okay. I don't know where he is. He was a he, is. he was a beast. Though. He was a cultural sensation at one point. I think Bro? I don't know. Yeah. Graham, how did you even know that? Did Who? you say Grandma Mar? No. Oh, no, 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 he's no. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah no, like no, I feel no, like both y'all almost even too young to know about yeah. that. Yeah, he would yeah, dress up like it. in a he was Larry Johnson in many ways. I don't know what what his height was, but like to me looked like a football player. Yeah. Like they he was an athlete, yeah. man, and just like dominated for a while then. There was like Morning and Larry Johnson. When did he come to the Heat? My dad got traded. It's funny. I was actually at the park the other day at my brother's basketball um, basketball tryout, and his coach is Glenn Rice's son. Oh, my Glenn goodness. was traded That's for my awesome. dad. So I see him walk up, and I'm like, hey, like, it's funny. Like, y'all got traded for one another, and y'all are friends now. That's yeah. cool. Um, Glenn Rice. Yeah. Glenn Rice. Glenn Rice. What a shooter. Yeah. He could, you said you had two coaches at Georgetown. Yeah. And kind of talking about the idea of, like, mature me. Me and you were talking mm -hmm. before we started – kind of got like two totally different things from different both of those ones. coaches. You enjoyed both of them. Sounds like you yeah, enjoyed I, I learned a whole lot. Patrick Moore, but yeah. What what were some of the things that you pulled from both of those guys? Man, I, I posted a video. You know, the person who I actually learned the most from at Georgetown was neither of those coaches. Mm. It was John Thompson Jr., mm. who was my dad's coach and he would sit courtside at a lot of our practices. And I posted a video yesterday that um, there was one day he called us over after practice and he would have us sit at his feet sometimes and he would just minister to us and share some things with us. And, um, this man was a devout Catholic and, um, he asked us one day, he's like, how do the wealthiest people in basketball make their money? And we're like, I don't know, we're guessing and really just missing. And he tells us, he's like sitting down. 
wealthiest people in basketball make their money sitting down. They don't make it running up and down the court. Mm. And it really clicked. I'm like, oh, shoot, like, he's right. Then how come as a kid, when I wanted to be a professional athlete, how come I see all these kids wanting to get their family out of poverty? Mm. And they want to be the athlete, but the average career is three years. There's only 450 guys in the NBA. Not to say you can't chase those dreams sure. and do that. But at the same time, like, let's be wise about it. I love Matthew 25. It's a verse that I teach from a yep. whole lot. And the parable of the um, talents. The talents. And the one with five, the one with two, and the one with one. And mm. the language is so important there. I think in verse 17 in the NLT, it says that the one with five went out and invested. Yep. <laughs> so that means the identity that that man had was an investor. There you go. Very good. So we have to invest what it is we have. We're yes. not out there working for it. There's no such thing as grinding in the kingdom of heaven. Mm. Grinding literally means to wear down. <laughs> and the blessings Great. of the Lord come without toil. Mm. So in that, we're meant to invest what's in our hand the whole entire time. Yep. And God has shown me being back in Miami during this season, like, oh, shoot. I've always had access to the Miami Heat Arena. It's just now I'm a chaplain for the Heat, and I'm using it in a different way. Yep. There you go. And it's like, whoa, the credential. I, was, I think I was telling you that the credential that they give me when I walk in as a chaplain doesn't work as well as my face because I can just walk in and say hi to anybody and move in any space. And it's like, wow, this is what it really means that any door that God opened, no man can close. And Absolutely. This, this is favor on another level, and it's really for him. So it's cool. Well, I also even like love the ideas you're talking about right now, like who you are yeah. has always been. Yes. And sometimes we're waiting for permission yeah. mm. to step into the thing that we've always been called to. Yeah. And it's like, oh, now I've got a title and I've got a lanyard. But in reality, I've been carrying God for a long time into exactly. this space. I just maybe didn't even know I could do it in this way. And I think exactly. that sometimes that can be freeing for people. Matthew 25, by the way, we could sit here for a long time oh. talking about that because that is a, a parable and a story that is so much about how the kingdom of God works. Mm -hmm. And there's so much in there that rages against... Um, American culture, uh, millennials and Gen Z, and I don't want to be the old guy sitting in here, but just so much about it is that God puts something in our hand, mm -hmm. and then he asks us to steward it and yeah. put it to work. Yeah. Uh, I think about Paul writing to Timothy. He's like, stir up the gift. So yeah. I gave you something. You got to invest it. You got to yeah. put it to work. It's not just going to happen. The one guy has the one talent. What does he do? He goes, let me bury it. Let me not do anything with it because I didn't want to lose it. Exactly. And so when you start living life, not to simply lose, instead of living life to win the game. Yeah, this is some is. athlete talk now. It's like yeah. some people who play the game and I'm playing the whole game just not to lose. Yeah. And I think about maturing as a man is that as you grow, it's like, I want to keep playing to win. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I want to, and, and winning by the way, is not me versus you. It's me versus me. Mm. Winning is not me versus Dakota. It's, it's me versus me. There and it's go. going, what has God given me? Let me put that thing to work yeah. because there will come a moment where he looks at it and says, all right, what did I give you? What'd you do with it? Mm -hmm. And we go, oh, I buried it. And here it is. I didn't lose it. Yeah. And God's like, Guess what he does? He takes it and he gives it to the guy who already has more. Yep. Yes. That's a whole word too. Yep. So we watch people keep growing. Yeah. You're like, it's not fair. So they already good. have so much. <clears throat> Maybe they have so much because they know how to steward that which was yep. given to them. Yeah. And so rather than go, I got one, three, or five. See, I'm see, I'm preaching too much here, but it's just I love it. Keep it's going. a power, but it's a powerful, powerful thing that you're bringing to the surface because I think for you, what what I kind of want to talk about today is like, was your dream to play basketball? Like, yeah. maybe even. Talk through that a little bit because mm -hmm. somebody could look from the outside. When I see you, I see someone who's like secure, confident, Thank you. content. You, that thing we just saw, like no on doubt. that interview, that's in you. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. You can't like that's yeah. just woo. Like yeah. yep. so, but in many ways, I think some people could have gone through the life that you've gone through, and they could have become jaded, disappointed. Yeah. Can you walk us through any of that? Like, yeah. was it always you need to play basketball? Was that because your dad was a famous basketball yeah. player? Mm -hmm. Can we maybe get into some of that? Having a dad who's sure, a famous basketball sure. player? Um, what I said in that video, I actually got a word in in Brazil when I was living down there this past year, and this guy comes up to me. We're doing this day of forgiveness, and this guy is led by the Spirit to come up to me, and he's like, hey, man, I, I think you need to release forgiveness towards yourself and your father. And I'm like, okay. Um, did that resonate when he said it to you, or did you think that, was that a weird word at first? It made sense. Okay. It made sense, and then he went into detail and gave me that word. He's like, hey... God wants you to know that your dad didn't introduce you to basketball. He introduced you to basketball, but he just used your dad to do it. And I felt this weight leave my shoulders. Beautiful, I'm like, oh, man. wow, I don't owe my dad anything. I don't owe him anything. Beautiful. I owe, I owe him everything mm. because he 
use my dad in that season to show me the game of basketball. So I love it. It's a burning desire that he's put on my heart to play. And it's, it's, this is a part of my testimony when I farted first, excuse me, not that, not farted. When I first started coming. <laughs> Classic, yeah. You know when what I, happened was I. Uh, yeah. Uh, when I first started coming to VU, I was living out in LA with a girl I was seeing at the time. And I was reading my word consistently. I just wasn't around community. I wasn't being discipled. And yeah. I was really just going about it in my own understanding, which is not what we're meant to do. And uh, I'm really struggling with my mental health. And I go out there to live with her. And we're also, I'm also training to play basketball. So this is during the pandemic. And the season had shut down. Yeah. And I'm like, all right, cool. And I'll open up about some other things as well. During that season, uh, I was really using weed heavily. And I noticed that when I was playing just before, I had a lot of teammates who had success who would go up to the NBA and play. And they would smoke weed. And I'm like, well, like at the end of the day, we're taking care of our bodies. So. I get it. Let me just do that. When I get back to Miami, this is before this girl and I had started dating. Um, the whole world shuts down. Yep. And my Nana, she starts to feel bad. And um, she was diagnosed with stage four colon cancer. Mm. And within a month, she had passed away. Oh, man. And that whole time, I started writing my graduate thesis. And this is how the Lord redeems things. I started my, writing my graduate thesis, and I called it Righteous High the moral and economic case for cannabis in the NBA and how it can be used as a tool for wellness and a vehicle for black investment to create generational wealth because there's wow. a huge disparity in the cannabis industry. I think as of 2017, 3% of the cannabis industry was owned by black and brown people, whereas 81% was owned by white people. Mm. Really? And there's a four to one arrest rate disparity between whites and blacks in the U.S. as a result of cannabis possession and wow. usage. Dear God. So there's these... Wow big stigmas that took place and I was so drawn to it. I'm like, okay. And my dad, by the way, one of the reasons why he developed a kidney disease is because opioid abuse. He developed an opioid addiction because he was the number one player on the team. Painkillers? Painkillers. Mm -hmm. Like Oxy or it was before the Oxy wasn't even around then yet. Toradol. Um, he, he tells a testimony. I'll actually share my, my grad thesis with you. Yeah. I love he tells it. a story of how this was, this was his rookie year in, uh, in Charlotte. And he's feeling like crap after a game. And all of a sudden, he goes to the trainer, and I think he gives him some Toradol. I think that's, that's what it was. Voltaren. No, it was a Voltaren. Okay. He takes his Voltaren and goes out to practice, and he says he felt like Superman. Mm. And from there, it was no turning back. Goodness from there, gracious, it was like, bro. oh, shoot. Like, I can play a game and catch an elbow in my throat and take this pill and go out and do it again the next day without feeling it. Wow. Like, let's do it. I'm in. I'm in. Right. You know? And, you know, this is a man who's providing for his family yep. and, 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 you know, uh, he comes from such a rough background that, like, you finally get to this point, you're having success, I'm not going to let anybody take this from me. Mm -hmm. Right. And I'm going to do whatever it takes in order to stay here. Mm -hmm. And um, that led to health issues later in life. So I'm really drawn to um, health during this season and as I start my career. But you were using weed because you found that you had benefits of like, what, what you felt like less anxious so, or? No, like it Tell was me what... really me taking care of my body in a way. Cause I, I lifted a whole lot. I think I was like close to 240 pounds at the same, at that time I'm like 220 mm -hmm. now. And I was lifting a whole lot, beating my body up and training. And I'm like, I'm not popping these pills. Right. I'm going to stretch and smoke. Mm -hmm. And I spent that whole semester in the pandemic um, really studying, and I learned a whole lot. So, like, my views on it, of course, were meant to be alert and sober-minded. There are different ways to take it now. Whether you're taking CBD, a full spectrum, and, and all these other things that allow you to consume it, take care of your body, and not numb yourself. But fast forward out to my time in L.A., um, I'm living with, with, with the girl I'm seeing, and I'm sitting on the couch. And something that I would do after I get done with my workouts for the day, I would come home and smoke or maybe take an edible and just zone out. That would be me flipping a light switch, essentially. Say my work day's done. And uh, I was watching Queen's Gambit on the couch, and uh, I see this young chess prodigy, and mm -hmm. she grows up in a, a rough rough environment as an orphan, and she um, is numbing herself with these prescription drugs in order to play this game that she loves. And the Holy Spirit touches my heart gently. He's like, hey, you're doing that to yourself. Mm. And I'm like, oh, my God. And then I realized the feeling that I was feeling when I came home after training, after I wasn't busy anymore, was sadness. 
because yeah. my Nana had just passed away. Yeah. So when I was writing my thesis in the other room, she was on her deathbed. And I was smoking and I was numbing myself and running away from all these emotions. Mm. And I've seen that in so many different levels. I've seen that with pro athletes. I've seen that with non-pro athletes. Correct. Just people who are escaping. Escaping. Yep. And I was escaping. And I remember shortly after that, I stopped, stopped smoking and really went cold turkey. Um, I struggled with, with that. I was using some other things out there, mushrooms and just really studying the science behind it. That was really my excuse. Sure. I know there's a benefit to these things, but like, hey, let me experiment with myself first. Yeah. And uh, man, shortly after that, I get a prompting to end that relationship and I go back home and um, I get a contract offer to go play in Mexico. And I'm like, boom, like I just got out of this relationship. Like I'm about to go hoop again. I've been working, training so hard. Now I get this opportunity. Let me go forget about this girl and let me go pour myself into basketball. Within a week, I had gotten COVID, and the team canceled their season because of the pandemic. Oh, my goodness. So I'm back home at my mom's house, and I had sold my car before I went out to L.A., and I told her to get rid of my bed, get rid of all my stuff because I'm not coming back. I come home, and I end up – I stay in my brother's – my little brother's bed. And funny enough, he had the same bed sheets that I had when I was a kid. So I'm in this cramped little race car bed or whatever it is <laughs> with COVID, and it's the 4th of July, and I hear these fireworks just popping off outside. I'm like – what's going on in my life? Like, I'm just lost. Mm -hmm. And I remember as soon as I get better, I call my friend uh, Chris Brito, mm. right? Y'all probably know. Um, and I'm like, dude, let's go to church. We connected before I went out to L.A. through a mutual friend. And uh, he's like, bro, let's do it. So I went. And I remember the first sermon. I think you all were gone on sabbatical. And Pastor Erwin McManus, he, mm. was, he was preaching. He preached the genius of Jesus. Yes. And... Um, I remember the altar call at the end. I remember that altar call, and I remember every single altar call for the rest of the month after that. I was raising my hand. I'm like, yeah. I'm here. I'm here. Yes, I'm here. You know, and I spent all this time reading the Word, so I got to know the Lord more in an intimate way. And about a few years before that, I remember my dad was dropping me off at the airport to go play somewhere. I don't know where I was going, maybe pre-draft or something like that. And uh, he's always said this to me, but for some reason it hit differently that day. He's like, put God first. Dang, my dad meant that this time. Yeah. I'm like, okay. So all I knew how to do, I put the Bible app as the first app on my phone. Good move. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's still there move. to this day, you know. Yeah. And, man, it's just those little tangible steps of faith. Like, I don't know what to do now. Like, what can you do? Yep. And I'm starting to look at this verse differently. I was meeting with uh, a therapist for a long time, and he would always talk about, I think it's 2 Corinthians 10.9. Um, it, my strength is made perfect in your, mm -hmm. in your weakness. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started to look at that verse differently. And attaching that to Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, uh, do not lean on your own, own understanding, but in all your ways submit to me, and, and he'll make your path straight. A lot of times, God doesn't want us to lean on our own understanding, but it doesn't mean we can't accept the fact that we understand what we understand now. Right. Our weakness sometimes is the fact that, yo, all I know how to do is set up a mic and start speaking. Yep. Okay, I'll take care of the rest. Just take that first step of faith. Yeah, absolutely. Do what you can do. Do what you can do, and I'll show up with the rest in your weakness. Well, I firmly believe that. Yeah. I think that people, if they're not careful, they misinterpret that. Don't lean on your understanding. I guess I know nothing. I guess I just will sit here and be idle. Exactly. And I think that is immature yeah. and foolishness. I think that God loves to collaborate. Yeah. He's actually inviting us into his story. There's a scripture that says, by faith, Moses is, uh, by faith. Counted as righteous. Uh, well, it's it's in Hebrews where um, Moses' his mom put him in the Nile. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a great picture. I've never really preached all the way, but like that seems like crazy. crazy. What are you doing putting a baby in a basket down the Nile River full of crocodiles and floating? That sounds irrational mm -hmm. and illogical. Mm -hmm. But when you realize wait a minute, they're killing all the baby boys. Yeah. This is the only option. Yeah. Sometimes faith, you can read it and go, we should do crazy stuff. Yeah. But that wouldn't be the full context. The full context is there's something crazy happening. Yes. Yeah. Correct. And the crazy response was due to the crazy context. Yeah. Yeah. And so you could there preach you it go. like, sometimes you got to put your baby in an aisle. Well, it's like that you'd be missing the point. The yeah. point is, is that this was her only option. Yeah. And by faith, she trusted God and it spared his life as this little baby boy ends up 
in the house of Pharaoh. Yeah. And he's a Hebrew boy who grows up to become, he's a type of Christ. He's the yeah. savior who, who frees them. And so I agree with you. Trust the Lord with all your heart, lean out on your own understanding in all your ways, acknowledge him and he'll make your paths straight. Yeah. You do what you can do. And then you go, man, there's a bunch I don't know. I'm doing what I do know to do today, exactly. God. And I'm trusting you for the, the gaps that, you know, you got to fill in. Exactly. I think that it's funny. I think things are relative. Like I have no idea what it's like to grow up with Alonzo Mourning as my dad. I have no idea what it's like to go to NBA games. Those are like our gladiators. Those are yeah. like superheroes. Correct. I mean, genuinely, like I would have had your dad's Correct. jersey, mm -hmm. you know, as a kid, the dream team. I think I had the morning dream team jersey or something, yeah. you know, like, but relative, I, and I, maybe I'm speaking for you too a little bit, Dakota, but like I have a strong father. Mm -hmm. I'm named after my father. Yeah. You're Alonzo the third. Yeah. You go by Trey. So funny. Remember, <laughs> Dakota? Sure. Remember when I was going to have, I was getting ready to name Wyatt. It's so funny, bro. This is so funny. But my son, Wyatt, who you know, who's six years of age, I didn't name my boy Rich the third because yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, we can talk about this in a second, but like, I kind of was always like, man, I kind of feel like I'm in the shadow of my dad being yeah. junior. And so when I grew up, I was like, I'm not going to name my boy. I'm going to give him his own name. Yeah. But Wyatt it is like, dad. Why didn't you give me your I name? I wish I had your name, wow. Dad. Like, These freaking kids, bro. Don't matter right. what you do. You name them after you, we're mad. Yeah. You don't name them after you, we're mad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But remember the night before, like, we told you guys that we were pregnant and yeah. you, you had a whole song? Yeah, yeah. We you found it. We went to celebrate. <laughs> He'll love this, though. Tell me. And the story. I was like, they, they finally, we, we went, went out to this night din uh -huh. nice dinner. We, I don't even think we had reservations, but we showed up. You know, when everything just goes right. Mm -hmm. Was Pilar there or Pilar wasn't? Nights. Was, oh, Pilar, Pilar wasn't was there. not there. David D's wife was not there. David D. Blair, myself, UDC, maybe Daniel. I'm not sure. I think Kuja was there. We went okay. eight years of infertility. I'm saying yeah, so. Yeah, we were yeah, telling yeah. them the news. They gave us the chef's wow. table, and they tell us. And afterwards, I'm like, I just just a song from my spirit, you know. I was just Trey. We're so proud of you. I love it. We love you, Trey. You know, I, I just he it. It, wrote a know, song called Trey from for my, my heart, unborn man. child. I received it. But uh, they they decided not to name him the third. So the <laughs> song was irrelevant. But I just yeah. I literally just remember that like you wrote a whole song called yeah, Trey. Yeah. yeah. Wow. <laughs> oh, uh, that's <laughs> a long. That that's song. another long intro to say. You have a strong dad, and I don't know. Maybe if you're even comfortable weighing into it. Yeah. For sure. I. When I was younger, like teenage years, I definitely felt like I was in the shadow or trying to maybe rage against the shadow of my dad. Yeah. Did you guys ever feel that way? Because I think maybe people yeah. are watching right now, they're yeah. like strong fathers, yeah. accomplished fathers, yeah. and finding your own identity in that a little bit. Mm -hmm. Like you even said you had to forgive. I don't know if that's yeah. connected to any of that. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, think win that, I think that what's interesting about the shadow of your father is that I think that there's two different shadows that we're talking about. And one of them being a son you cannot control. Yeah, exactly. Which is the world's definition of what the shadow is. Mm. And so I think living in the shadow is your choice. Very good. I think the world seeing you in the shadow is not your choice. Okay. And it's something that you have to understand. Like, like for instance, like the, this weekend is the Super Bowl. And Kyle Shanahan is one of the greatest offensive minds that the NFL has seen in the last 10, 15 years. He's accomplished things that people have never accomplished in their career. But guess what? There's an article this week. Kyle Shanahan's accomplished doing so many things for years. This is not yeah. his first year. Yeah. And it says, will Kyle Shanahan finally step out of the shadow of his father? Mm. He's like, like, I already did that. that yeah, I did that's that. what I'm saying. I'm it's free like, of that. What, why are you putting that back on What me? do I have to do? His yeah. dad did win two Super Bowls. I'm not saying his dad was doing great, but it's like, that's what I'm saying. You can do a lot, and the world is still going – Oh, you haven't done enough to step out of the shadow. Yeah. And so I think for me, one of the thoughts that I have is like, hey, if somebody thinks I'm in my dad's shadow, that's on them. I can't control what they think. Yeah. But me living in that shadow is going to be my choice and a decision that I have to yeah. make on the inside. Yeah, it's really good. That's good. I, I, one of the first conversations that we had, uh, we talked about this. And I asked you this question because it was so. Yeah, you did. I remember this now. Yeah, it was, it was so much on my heart. I'm like, man, like. I remember when I found out that your dad was a pastor, mm. and I'm like, yo, that's crazy. Like, I would love to sit down with him and, and, and talk about it. And uh, I remember getting a word from the Lord in, in Psalm 91, in verse 1, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. You better preach, bro. And when the Lord... Hey, the Miami Lord, Heat, we're about to take him. Geez, He's taking bro. over a location for Goodness the church. Gracious. Pay right. this man money, Rich. It's actually a volunteer job. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but man, what 
the Lord said to me, he said, son, if you're in my shadow, you're not in your father's shadow. Dang. Come on, bro. Beautiful. And I remember seeing uh, this meme on, it was a GIF on Instagram. Um, and I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing it, GIF or GIF. I never know, bro. I never know. Doesn't matter. It requires was, an interpretation either which way. Exactly. It's tomato, yeah. tomato. Welcome to a heavenly language. Hey, my GIF, GIF. <laughs> But anyways, um, it's this windmill going around and around and around. And there's this guy who's jumping over the shadow of the windmill. He's like, oh, shoot, like the shadow's going to get me. The shadow's going to get me. But in actuality, it's just a shadow. Like the windmill's up there. Like you're not going to get touched. And you're jumping for no reason. You're wasting all of this energy mm. for no reason, you know. Um, it's a word. And, yeah, I just think that, like, there are there's certain things you can't run from, you know. Like, Correct. Uh, you, you can't run from it. And it's like Jonah, like. If you try to run, you're going to end up where I've called you to be in the first place. Mm -hmm. Like, I can never run for ba from basketball. Mm -hmm. I can't. You know? And another word the Lord gave me, I went through a season where I went by Alonzo, and that still causes some confusion now, which is dying down. But um, what Alonzo means is ready for battle. There you go. And what the Lord spoke to me, he said, Alonzo, they're not relying on you. They're relying on me to work through you. Yeah. And he said that the battle isn't even yours. It's mine. And the reason you're ready for battle is because you're the weapon that I'm using in order to fight this battle. Mm. You're not even doing the fighting. You're just in my hands. Mm. So when we're in the hands of the Father, we are a weapon. And I think that's what David really saw when he stepped out on that battlefield and he asked, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Yep. He wasn't asking that in a way because if we all pulled up to the fight, and Dakota, you walk out like, yo, who is this uncircumcised dude right here? I'm like, dude, first of all, why do you know that? That's me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what's up, bro? It's like, what's up, bro? Yeah. Like, that's a little weird. Right. You know, but David understood that's the funny. covenant that was made with yep. his people. Mm. And he understood that, oh, whoever blesses you, I will bless. Whoever mm. curses you, I will curse. So he knows that Philistine is uncircumcised. He's not a part of the covenant. And he knows how serious the covenants are. Yeah. So he's going out and fighting on God's word. He's not going out Preach. and fighting in his own strength because he knows, he's like, oh, shoot, I'm not the one fighting. He's literally doing mm. what God said would happen and what he's going to do. He knew the outcome before the battle even started. He wasn't afraid because he knew who was actually fighting Very the battle. Good. Mm -hmm. So he went out and won the war and he killed Goliath. He said, I will kill you. And God will conquer you. Mm -hmm. I know I'm good. I have that confidence. I'm going to pick these five stones up and, like, that's all I need. And I think it's so cool because the, there are five Philistine towns and he had the five stones. Yep. Mm -hmm. And Goliath had four other brothers. Yep. So there's five of them in total. He's intentional. He's like, I'm going to go get you right now. Right. I'm going to kill you. But I know God will do the conquering. There you mm -hmm. go. So I, I think that. Very good. It's just really. Yeah, it's great. Man, like the gospel is so simple. It's the truth that's simple. It's lies that are complicated. Very yeah. good. And I feel like a lot of the times when it comes to identity and knowing who you are, like once you know who God says you are, you're able to be like, oh, it doesn't matter who you say. I think Pastor GC preached this before. It's like, uh, I think she was talking about when, when you were courting her at first. He's like, like, girl, you're so pretty. He's like, I know. Like my dad told me. Yep. Mm-hmm. You know, like she already knows because she heard it from her father. Yep. And you've talked about this as well. Like the affirmation comes from the father. Comes from the father. Mm -hmm. You know, and Jesus was affirmed before he even started anything. Like you, That's a bar, right? That whole thing. Oh, my goodness. Like he didn't do anything. He just came out the waters. He's like, this is my son with who I am well pleased. There you go. I didn't do anything. I'm well pleased with you. There you go. What's our favorite bar ever, Dakota? Our favorite Tennyson bar? It wasn't David versus Goliath. It was? It was Goliath versus God. Ooh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Fire. That'll preach. Yeah. Yeah. That's That'll all he preach. does. That's all. Shout out, Doctor Tennis. Yeah. Hey, newsflash, it's not David versus Goliath. It's God versus Goliath. Yeah. Yeah. And last time I checked, just so good, man. He's got a total knockout record. Amen. <laughs> and and exactly what you just battle. said. It's like he's, he's never you're, lost you're, a battle. Mm. He never <laughs> lost a battle. <laughs> hey, what, hey, hey, what's our? Remember Chandler Moore? Oh plays my the God. Heat? I thought Rich, about that. I can't today. say it. I, I we can't say it or we can't say it. I, I think we can't say it. Kyle got traded. Kyle Lowry. Oh, yeah, Kyle. We were watching the finals last year. He thought Kyle Rowley. And, I, I, like, I think he looks like Chandler Moore. He's like, Kyle, Rowley, Kyle Lowry looks oh like Chandler Moore. And I could not unsee it. And like, and oh, every time goodness. we'd see it, he would Run go, oh, uh, <laughs> what's this all we'd always do? He'd always do? If you ever wonder. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime Kyle 
why we make a oh, If you oh, ever no. wonder I what heaven you, looks like, God, we you. would do it every oh, time they go on a run. It's like, do you ever wonder? When on, the heat would go on a run, y'all would sing that song. Yeah, anytime Kyle would get a bucket. Bro, he'd be sitting there. The train be like, do you ever wonder? It's like, bro, watch Kyle Lowry. We love you, Kyle, if you're watching. Trey actually like knows him. He's his pastor. That's awesome. But that is the bar. I, I love yeah. what you were talking about in, in the, the viral reel. And like you said, I think it's it's funny. So many people go viral for different things. Yeah. Even as you're speaking, you did the same thing in the video. You answer with a verse and then comment. Yeah. I, that's a powerful thing because you're given the truth of, hey, this is why I believe this. And then I'll tell you my opinion based off the question yeah. and the scripture together. Yeah. And I think it's one of the probably the things that resonate with people's souls is they're hearing the truth of God's word. Yep. Uh, but also, even in that video, it was my first time seeing it, you're someone who is just so grounded and present. Thank you. I had a small group last night, and someone brought up, you know, one of the things that I'm fighting to be is present. Mm. What an interesting like thing to be. I think that's the majority of people. Right. If, they'd actually, if they could actually confront it and be yeah. honest. And, and someone even in the crew, that I thought it was so vulnerable of them to share is that yeah. even whenever I'm here. I'm somewhere this, else. This is someone that's been coming to my crew for over a year. Even when I'm here, it's hard for me to be mm -hmm. here. I think one of the things that I love about you, uh, my brother D was meeting with you the other day. I said, watch Trey. He's going to be the most present person that you meet with. Me and you had coffee about Thank a you, year man. ago. And I was just, I was honestly inspired to be, be more mature in that mm. way. I think that's a mark of maturity. Thank you, man. Because what you're doing is you're putting value on the person that you're with. Yeah. That day that we had coffee, I felt valued by you. Focus on me, look at me in my eye, speak in life. But just comfort, you're not even encouraging, but just the fact of how focused you are on me. Maybe we, we talk a little bit about that because to be present, to be that strong, you do have to know your identity. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes having a, a strong dad, I think that you can know who as a family we are without knowing who you are. Mm. Say that one more time. I know who we are as a family. I know who the Durans are. Oh, well, yeah. Who is Dakota, though? Yeah. And I think you are, you're not a, someone who's just the macro, you're, yeah. you're yourself. Was there a journey of, how did you become so, how did you become yeah. so confident? Was that the same battles everybody else is facing, mm -hmm. you think, that doesn't have Alonzo Mourning as a dad? Yeah. Or was that a different battle you had to face? A, a couple things. I think about a prayer. All of it comes back to prayer, man. Yeah. Like what I say at the end of the videos that I post is, as always, prayer works. Mm. It's two-sided, too, because prayer works. And also prayer works. You got to yep. pray and put in the work. Absolutely. And one of the prayers I wrote down is like, Trey, thank you for feeling everything. Thank you for agreeing. It was a letter that I actually wrote to myself. I'm like, thank you for agreeing to feel everything. And that, to be honest, it's tough. It's, it sucks sometimes. Because um, I think the reason why we want to run and not be present is because we don't want to feel the awkwardness that we feel right now. Mm. But when we sit down and unpack, like, why do I actually feel awkward right now? I've been nervous before games. I remember I was playing a game in New Zealand last year. And looking back, I realized this. I don't think I ever told the coach this. But I missed that game. I was feeling under the weather, but I realized that I was actually anxious. After the fact, I'm like, oh, shoot, that's what I was feeling. Mm. The reason I had tightness of my chest, I just moved. I took four flights, and I'm living in the farthest place in the world from my house. It was an amazing experience. I love that team, and I will go back. At the same time, I'm like, shoot, the reason I missed this game wasn't because I wasn't feeling well. It was actually because I'm halfway around the world, and I was really anxious. Yep. And that's what led me to before games, really being present and feeling what I feel. Because what I am really passionate about is showing up as the same person in each space I go into. There you go. It's maturity. I've seen a lot of basketball players. And, you know, you've, you've said this before, that we can either be the, the thermostat or the thermometer, right? We want to be the thermostat. And within the sporting world, we can – we're going to have a, you know, a camera in my face sometimes. I'm going to be – kissing babies and sometimes maybe signing babies and, you know, yep. all this stuff. Yeah. But then when I get off the court, I'm going to have to go home to my family. I'm going to have to go home. And I've seen a lot of guys when they retire, they retire and they're like, shoot, what do I do with my time? Mm -hmm. Because when I was really, 
when I was playing and doing all of these things, I had so much to do. And as basketball players, like one of the most difficult things for me when I had stepped away from playing basketball the first time is that um, I didn't know what to do with my time. I have to work out now, and it's not in my day. It's not in my work day. Yep. Like I have to actually put it on my calendar. I remember when uh, a girl I was dating, she showed me Google Calendar for the first time. I was like, what? This is my new best friend. I love Google Calendar <laughs> as it buzzes in my pocket. But like – we really have to be intentional now about how I plan my day because it's no longer this plug and place thing. Everything's not done for yep. me. I yep. have to figure out what it is, what is it that I like. And the more we actually sit with ourselves, the more we figure out who it is we actually are. Yeah. And uh, I went through, I'm going to tell a story about uh, my time in college. I was really struggling with, with my mental health at one point. And this is after um, two years of really working my butt off at Georgetown to get this job to go play. Um, and, uh, we're having picture day the third year and I'm still feeling frustrated. And this is back before I really sat with my feelings. I um, got into it with one of my teammates on picture day. And this is a new guy to the team. And I was really butting heads with him. I was just frustrated. And um, I felt like nobody had my back and I really felt down. And that night, um, I remember feeling so low and so down. I picked up my food at Sweet Green. And then uh, I walked to the middle of Key Bridge in Georgetown. And I spit over the edge to see how high it was. Because I was so low. I was like, what do I do? And um, I end up going back home. And Were you thinking about like hurting yourself? I was thinking yourself? about taking my own life. Because mm. I didn't know what to do. I felt all these feelings. And like Tim Ross has talked about this, how if you don't, if it never comes out, it's going to come out yep. some way. Yep. You're going to do something to yourself. You're going to do something to somebody else. If you don't get an outlet, you'll have an outburst. Exactly. You know, and I was about to have an outburst. I wanted to hurt somebody because I felt so frustrated. I felt like I was putting a lid yep. on my emotions mm. because I was told to, within sports, you're told to suck it up. Suck it up. Hey, suppress. Next suppress. play, suppress, suppress. But next play doesn't mean suppress. One of my favorite authors and a buddy of yours, John Mark Comer, mm. he wrote a book that changed my life. Two, actually. One is Live No Lies. Mm. And Live No Lies, that's where I get the sharing the word of God first. Because like if the enemy presents a lie, and this is where I was going with that story, um, if the enemy presents a lie, we have to then present the truth. That's how Jesus fought the devil yep. in the desert. You know, it was simple too. He said three things, and that man ran away. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's the gospel so simple, so simple. Um, but anyways, well, even that idea, like you have to resist. The Bible is very clear. You have to resist. The enemy's coming. Resist. He's coming. You have to resist, and the way that you resist is usually by reciting. But if you don't there know you it. Go. You ain't got nothing in the clip. You have bro. to give word, get the word in you. And like this is so the words bullets, bro. You got nothing. You got an empty clip, Oof. bro. Like take the safety off. Yeah, it's cool. You got a Bible in your house. You ain't ever read it. Read it though. Read it. Read it. And Shoot. like for me, for me, like this is a part of maturity too, because you have to know how you like to consume certain information. So with the clients that I work with, I sit down with them. I recommend books all the time. I'm always reading, listening to stuff. Great. I prefer audio books over physical books. Yep. So I'm still getting in the Word every day. I don't have to necessarily sit down with my Thompson King James reference Bible and, yeah. you know, do that. I can open the Bible app and I'll press play. And I'll get in three, four chapters and I'll listen and really meditate on the Word and maybe follow with my finger and my eyes. I'm still getting in the Word. Yeah. Yep. And I feel like the enemy sometimes tries to convince us that it's so much work in order to do what it is that we're actually totally. being called to do. But it's really simple. Like, God is making a way, and he's putting the desire in our heart to do what it is that he wants us to do. So it, it's, it's, it's really important uh, what we say to ourselves. But what I was saying with this story, um, next day I actually go in and I speak with one of the, I speak with one of the, uh, the coaches that I had, you know. And uh, I'm like, yo, like, I don't feel like practicing today. Uh, I tell him what happened, and I thought about taking my own life, and, He's like, okay, like go home, like just. So you told him that. I told him that. You know, that's pretty cool that you had enough wherewithal or honest enough to tell him that. That's my, a big deal. My cousin, I met with my cousin the night before when I came back um, from the bridge. Uh, my cousin actually had to come by and pick something up. She was two years older than me at Georgetown, and I told she's like, hey, how are you? And I was just, yo, I just thought about taking my own life, and it scared me to even say. It was yeah. like, this is real. 
I remember writing, this wasn't like a, a suicide letter or anything, but I remember writing a letter, um, a journaling, saying what, what it was that I was feeling, and I read it out loud, and I just started bawling, like, oh my, I just thought about doing that. Yeah. That's ridiculous. That's, what? And she says, like, hey, you should tell your parents. So I tell my parents, my mom ends up flying up, and I, I see her. Um, but the next day, I have to go to practice, and, you know, I tell the assistant coach at the time, and the assistant coach was actually Patrick, his son. Mm. And he played uh, at Georgetown as well several years before me. And I'm like, dude, like, I just thought about taking my own life. And uh, he's like, well, like, do you want to practice today? I'm like, no. Go home, chill. Next day I come into the gym. One of the coaches says to me, um, one of the first things he says, he's like, hey, man, key bridge isn't high enough. And I was like, what? Like you're you're my coach. Like I'm supposed to feel protected by you, and like Dang. you say this to me, and it was just like this ton of bricks that just hit me, and I was like, oh my god, like I, I was lost, you know. And now I look back, and I'm able to teach from this now and say, who told you that? I hear some people talk something. Well, I'm I'm somebody who's overwhelmed. I'm, I'm bad with names. Um, I show up late to things. That's just who mm -hmm. I am. Who told you that? Did God, is it in the word of God? Did he tell you that? Well, no. So, well, it's a lie. It's simple, and sometimes the truth hurts, but I love this about the Lord. It says that um, as the vidner, right, he's going to cut on us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. When he cuts on us, it's going to hurt, but it's not going to harm us because he has plans to prosper us and not harm us. The enemy wants to harm us. What God does will hurt, but it won't harm us. Very good. And it has to do with perspective. Amen. That's a, the idea of God pruning us at yeah. times, which is the big word, you know. We're pruned to produce. That, the whole idea of a garden being pruned is so that it can produce more fruit. Correct. Yeah. And I think sometimes we think when God's pruning us that he's punishing us, it's like, no, one of the most loving things he could do is cut that thing out. You know, exactly. If you got cancer in your body, mm. we got to cut it out. I don't right. feel good to have cancer no. cut out, but if we don't deal with that cancer, it's going to destroy the That's entire right. body. And I think the word of God is a sword, yeah. and many times it is a scalpel, yeah. and he comes in and, and he cuts away. And I think, I think what I, I admire about you, and even I think even in your like lostness, it's weird how... I, I've always said this way, God doesn't make you one way to use you another. Mm. So he gives you a personality. He gives you like your, um, your giftings. And back to Matthew 25, like there's so many ways that he already made you yeah. and developed you. And so those things are there. It's just, they're usually running in the wrong direction yeah. until they're surrendered over to God. It's like, I think all of my great strengths are usually my worst weaknesses if they're not submitted over to God. Exactly. And so I think that you've always been a person who desired depth Thank you. And didn't want yeah. to live at the surface. Yeah. So even as you like, like even at a point so low that you want to take your life, you still had enough wherewithal to go, this isn't healthy. Yeah. I'm not in a good spot. I should tell somebody. And I, I'm just even taking a moment right now because someone's listening. Yeah. And so many people suffer in silence. Mm. Yeah. It's like the fish tank in the, you know, that you have like an aquarium and I don't know if it ever happened to you as a kid, but like somehow the temperature got turned up and you didn't know it. Yeah. You wake up the next morning, all the fish are dead. Yeah. And it's like, how long were they screaming, but you couldn't hear? Mm. And so many people, when it comes to things like depression or anxiety, mm. they don't know how to even scream. And like their life is getting hotter and the temperature's yeah. increasing. And if anything, even from today's just conversation, it's like, please tell somebody. Yeah. I mean, for the love of God, tell somebody, don't suffer in silence. Yeah. That's the enemy's plan. Yeah. The enemy wants to isolate us and get us to be alone and to think that we're all alone. There's no one there to help us. And it's so damaging. And this idea of truth, what does the truth do? You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Mm -hmm. It is for freedom Christ. that Christ free. has set us free, Amen. that the Lord yeah. desires for you to live liberated and free, yeah. wants to walk in beautiful relationship with you. And yep. Think about that analogy. I don't know if you've heard this before, but use this with the heat tonight. Rich, <laughs> come on, bro. But like a bank teller, they don't study. Yeah. You know, they don't right. study the the counterfeits. The counterfeits. Mm -hmm. They study the real thing. Yeah. Because I got to get so, so accustomed to what the real thing feels like 
And that way there's too many counterfeits. Mm. There's more lies yeah. than there are. The truth is simple. Yeah. The lies are complicated. Yeah. The lies are intertangled. It's like, whoa, what is that? And it feels this way and it feels kind of good. And the lies are becoming more and more creative and more and more sophisticated. I think technology just makes sin more sophisticated. Right. I was in crew last night as well. I love crew because I like community. I like even so this good, kind of yeah. style. Sometimes me and Trey get together or me and Dakota get together. And it's like, we just start preaching at each other a little mm-hmm. bit. I think it's good. I think you need brothers. You can like, oh yeah, Amen. but what about this, bro? And Amen. preach some bars. And I was in my crew last night and we were kind of on similar subject. And I'm, I'm going to bring this full circle now. Like how you're, I think you're dressed today for your day. You're dressed for success. Yeah. Well, the Bible gives us a uniform that we're supposed to put on. Correct. It's the breastplate of righteousness. Amen. But if you don't put that breastplate on, guess what you put on? You put on self-righteousness. Mm. It's the belt of truth. Guess what happens if you don't put the belt of truth on? You put on the belt of lies. Mm. <laughs> and it's the belt of lies that always leaves with your pants down. Hello, yeah. now I'm preaching. But I'm just saying, like, yeah. there's actually like, a uniform good. that we have to actually yeah. put on and yeah. dress ourselves for the day that's ahead of us. And I think, uh, I just applaud you from Thank one you, man, man to another. Appreciate that. Um, I think part of maturing, I was talking to our staff today, is like, part of maturing is like, not everyone's going to celebrate you. You yeah. have to learn how to celebrate yourself. David encouraged himself in the Lord. Mm-hmm. But man, it is beautiful in community when someone can step back and say, hey, man, that's it. I see you. Yep. Yeah. And I see the work that you're doing. Thank you, man. And I applaud you. And my applause will not be enough to keep you going, but it might be enough bite-sized today to encourage you just going, bro, it's amazing what God's doing in your life. And, Daily bread. And we're, we're amazed by it. I do think it's kind of a fun way like, on this maturity thing because you sort of prayed a crazy prayer before you went to Brazil. Mm. And maybe we can kind of give a little bit of a context that you went down to Brazil because the Lord led you to. Yeah, yeah. Out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. But this prayer that you told me, and maybe I'm going to say this wrong and you can clarify it. God, I don't even want to recognize. Yeah. Can we go there for a this second? Was, I think there's a good way to kind of come towards the end actually, here. This was a New Year's prayer. Yeah, pray, tell, tell about year, that. A year ago from, you know, today, let's say. And, 23 uh, to 24. 20, yeah. And I was like, God... I was looking at myself in the mirror. I'm like, God, I don't even want to recognize myself next year when I look at myself in the mirror. And I've been having these Moses moments where uh, another verse that, that I love and the Lord speaks to me through. And by the way, if, if you read the word and you strike gold, keep digging there because there's more gold there. there you there's go. a reason why you found that verse. Keep digging there. Um, Exodus 4.2. And it's when the Lord asked Moses, what's in your hand? And the Lord has given Moses this vision for what he's going to do. He's going to lead the people of Israel out of bondage mm-hmm. and into the promised land. And Moses is making all these excuses as to why he can't do the things that God is calling him to do. Man, I stutter. He's like, yo, who made the mouth? Like, what are you talking about, bro? Mm-hmm. And um, he's like, what's in your hand? And Moses says, I have this shepherd's staff in my hand. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's like, okay, throw it on the ground. And he throws it on the ground and turns into a snake. And then he runs from it. What the Holy Spirit spoke to me is that he didn't run from it because it turned into a snake. He ran from it because it was something that he was familiar with his whole entire life that he had used in a different way, that when God told him something different to do with it, it did something miraculous. Mm. So for me, me being this different person, not being able to recognize myself, God has done it with the tools that I've already had in my head. There you go. I've always had access to the Miami Heat Arena. I've always had access had baby pictures in there. I've laughed and cried. I've spent more time in that arena than some of the players. Probably spent more time in there than LeBron, like D-Wade, like mm-hmm. for real. Yep. And now the lanyard that I have doesn't work as well as my face to walk in and preach the gospel and evangelize the people and pray for the sick and give people words of encouragement in an arena where, you know, like I remember like just the culture of – the NBA, the culture of yeah. basketball, you know, it's not the healthiest culture and it's not the most biblical culture in the world. And I mean, the, it probably is biblical because some wild stuff happened in the Bible, but like in terms of uh, fidelity, in terms of keeping your eyes fixed on what is most important and playing the game, yeah. like it's not one of those places. There's a lot of distractions in the heat arena, you know? And I love this, that the devil can't create anything. He can only pervert what's already been created. <sighs> So good. So the bodies that are on Instagram screens and the bodies that you see at heat games are like, dang, she look good. Like, don't let the enemy pervert that, mm-hmm. you know. Um, 
man, like the fact that I can be used as a tool for God in that space now that I've already been in growing up, it's making me run a little bit, it's making me feel like running. And I feel like what you were talking about, Dakota, with sitting with emotions mm -hmm. and really being present, that's the tough part. Imagine if Moses was truly present with what he was feeling. Right. And he was like, God, I want to run. One of my favorite, oof, this is so good. One of my favorite stories in the Bible, and I love playing what if with the Bible, is when Jesus has a conversation with the Pharisees. And then the Pharisees, they all turn around. And they're like, yo, like, what do we say? Like, he's, if we say this, <laughs> they're going to think, it was about John, when they're asking about John. Yeah. It's like, because if we say this, they're going to pick up stones and stone us. But if we say this, he's going to be like, well, why didn't you trust him? Because he was a prophet. And they turn around and lie to Jesus. The reason it was written in scripture and the reason Jesus asked that question, Jesus never asked anything he didn't know. So Jesus already knew the answer to the question. What if they were honest with where they were? What if those Pharisees were like, yo, we're honestly afraid that we're going to get stoned today if you do this, but if you're the Messiah, I know you can save us. What if they were honest in that moment? Think about all God did through one Pharisee. Think about all God did through Paul. Imagine all those Pharisees right there with their one yes, with their one honest mm. moment of like, yo, this is where I am. Yep. This is the season that I'm in. Mm -hmm. And I, I find so many people feeling as if there's these rules and, and standards of how we're meant to approach the Lord. You got to approach your father however you are right now. You'll get there. You'll get eventually. You'll learn Christianese eventually. You will. You'll learn. You'll get a heavenly language and learn how to pray in tongues. You'll get all that. It's just right now, you'll be like, hey, man. I'm tired right now. I ain't got no food. What I'm going to do? Amen. That's a prayer, yep. you know? Yep. Absolutely. That's a prayer. If you can't admit where you are, he can't get you to where you need to be. Exactly. And that's just a huge principle. Like, Correct. It's honesty. And I think we grow. Yeah. Like we grow in grace yeah. and we grow in strength. But like, the whole idea about being present, a lot of it comes down to the world that we live in right now is so fast paced. Yeah. I was, we were in crew and we were praying. I looked over and God bless it. I don't want to call someone out, <laughs> but like someone's there texting. Mm. I'm not even shaming the person. I've probably done it before. Yeah, I'm just yeah, saying yeah. it's more about, I'm even this two minute prayer moment. Right. I still am need to be somewhere else. Yeah. And I have an opportunity to be somewhere else. Yeah. There you go. And what you have to learn about God is that, God exists outside of time, but his power is right here today. He's waiting for me tomorrow, no doubt about it. He's redeemed my past, but like the power is today. Amen. Mm. The miracle is today. I'm not going to be happy when and happy then. I can be happy now. Yeah. Peace isn't awaiting for me after I get through this trial. Peace is here in the midst of the trial. Yeah. But you don't get that power if you're not present. Yeah. You don't get that change if you don't admit where you're weak. Amen. I can't change what I don't confront. Yeah. My body doesn't get better if I don't go, my body's bad. <laughs> you know what I mean? My mind doesn't get sharper if I go, my mind's weak. So we have to actually be honest, I mm -hmm. think. And that's the whole idea of what, what I see. The, the reason why I think that Jesus was so tough on the Pharisees is not because they were worse sinners than the other sinners. They just weren't honest about their sin. There it is. Yeah. <clears throat> you know what I mean? It's just like, Correct. we good. Oh, you good? Yeah. I, there's not much to work with if yeah. you're good. Yeah. If you don't need a savior, I don't do self-help. Yeah. I don't do coaching. I do life change and life transformation. And I think about that whole positive and negative, that the power is in the positive and the negative. God's the positive, I'm the negative. <laughs> it's yeah, a battery, yeah, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, yeah. whew, that's where all, all that power comes from. And it's good. Um, I just appreciate the things that you're saying. Thank you. I think that all of us can grow in this. Um, one of the things that we've kind of been asking people, and well, I think the journey that Dakota and I are on is we're kind of even starting all this. We're not looking to entertain people. We're looking to have honest conversations that are helpful. I think maturity is about being helpful. Right. Yeah. Maybe in closing, an honest moment, when you're praying that prayer, God, mature me, what are some things that are coming to your mind personally for you that you feel like I'm immature in this category or I'm asking God to mature me? Is there maybe a category space that you can think of quickly that that is true for you that might end up being very helpful for somebody else listening? Money, mm. money, um, you had said this during a sermon. I talked to you afterwards. I was like, this is during heart and soul. You were like, uh, 
maybe you need to mature in the areas where you don't trust God enough, where he's already come through and he's proved to you that he's coming through. And it's kind of like this, dang, like, how many times am I going to moan and groan and, and, and whine about not being where I thought I was going to be? You know, I've had uh, opportunities to play overseas for a lot of money, and I turned those down in obedience to God. And I'm kind of like, dude, like, why, why would I wait for that? You know, why, 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 why am I saying no to these opportunities, God? Um, just really learning to trust him in that. Yeah. And knowing that like something he spoke to me yesterday, uh, about my time, I'm really big on organizing my time and my schedule and all that stuff. And he's like, yo, whose time is it? <laughs> and I go, shoot, it's yours. Like you gave it to me, you know? So it's, it's, uh, a repositioning and understanding who who's the giver, like praising the giver, not the gift, and not putting the gift over the giver. And I think that's that's where um, I've been praying and been asking the Lord to do a work in me in terms of maturity. Cause, so good, bro. Um, one of the the teachers I love, he's a, a coach of mine by proxy. His name's Myron Golden, mm. and he talks a lot about um, Christ in the marketplace, and he talks about how. I've heard some of his stuff. He's, yeah, he's, man, he's good. really, really, really good. And he's talking about be fruitful and multiply mm -hmm. and how first you have to be before you do. Like mm -hmm. a fruit is produced by a seed, oh, yeah. right? And the character of the seed is already inside. What the fruit is, like it's already inside itself. Like mm -hmm. you can't plant an apple seed and get lemons. Mm -hmm. this is, but what happens when they plant you, right? Mm -hmm. What happens when you get planted? What happens when... What comes out of you? That's so good, bro. You know? What comes out of you, Coco? <sighs> Probably like... Problems. Uh, problems. Chaos. Uh, yeah. Yes, Drama. Uh, that's good, bro. What you just said So was good, man. Fire. Thank you, bro. So good. Every time he starts talking, I start like... He's got me thinking, man. He got me. He got man, me I'm happy spinning, to come back. Bro. He's got me thinking. Oh, we gotta get, we're just going to get you, you know, every week up in here, man. Oh, I love it. We're all, we're all on, the, on this journey of growing and yep. maturing. I was with a friend late two nights ago he's older and um he had just did the funeral d done the funeral for um a family member of his this family member was very successful i'm talking about like sat on ma massive boards probably worth a couple hundred million dollars kind of yep. success knew multiple presidents and uh they had his funeral he did the ceremony and then they went out to the funeral site and uh they kind of it was raining, and so they couldn't take the casket all the way um, to the burial site. So it was on this road, this little white tent. Um, the casket that was chosen, just pretty simple, pretty just casual. Not, not, not the best flower arrangement, just kind of. And they sort of finished this whole thing, and they, they walked off, and the whole family was kind of in the distance. And it sounds so, like, harsh, but as he was over with the group of people in the distance, he looks over, and, like, here comes some guys from the funeral home, and they're kind of taking this old casket off, and they've got it, like, on some trailer with some mud on the tires and they slide off. It's just for a moment, they're just sitting on the ground. There's no one even around it. Just mm. on this concrete ground. They're all mm -hmm. over there. It's like, and he has this like, Oh my God, mm -hmm. like, Hey, let's not look over there. You know, like here's this great successful man. Yep. But before any of us go, I'm going to go out different from that. That's how we all go. Yes. Naked. I came and naked. I will leave. Yep. And it's just an old wooden box sitting over yep. there. No one's around it. It's just sitting out in the open, getting ready to go into the ground. Yep. A great man, a strong man. It's like, bro, if that's not sobering to you. Correct. It is. If that's not like, what the frick am I doing with my time? Yes. What am I getting upset about? <clears throat> what am I angry about? This doesn't lead me to be lackadaisical, by the way. It doesn't lead me to be like, oh, let me do exactly. nothing. It leads me to be passionate about the right stuff. You got it. I, want, I think there's things to get, J Jesus got angry. What are we getting angry about? Mm -hmm. Jesus was intense. What are we intense about? Yeah. It's monopoly. You need to play the whole game and then put it all back in the box. Yes. Everything goes back in the box. Yeah. All the stuff you accumulate. And maturity for me is like paying attention. Mm -hmm. Paying attention. The realization that that doesn't make me say nothing matters. Yeah. That makes me refine what, what actually matters. Amen. It makes me get invigorated about, oh, this, this doesn't matter. My feelings of what they think about me, 
my lies or the enemies tell. It's like, no, I can actually walk in more confidence because of the story that you just said. Yeah, you man. know, like life is that. It's been like haunting me. I don't know if I'm even like allowed to share it the way, but I'm just going, it was yeah. like just a sobering Sheesh. image. Like, yeah. Because we, 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 you know, what's a profit of man? Mm-hmm. Gain the whole world. Forfeit. I'm not saying this man even forfeit. It's all I'm just going, it's just a good sobering thought. Like, bro, like, let's get the right things yeah. and focus on it and do the part we're, we're supposed to uh, play. Yeah. Trey, you're a gift. Thank we're praying you, for you. We're loving you. Um, we're praying for the heat. Hey, Amen. Go, go heat, heat, baby. Hey, heat I, culture. I'm, uh, heat nation. I'm an extended chaplain from afar. I just I just pray for the team. And then when I go, I bring my shofar and I pray that walls come down. <laughs> You're an intercessor for the <laughs> You look up one time with the guys. That was like, you? Why does Rich have a shofar? That was you blowing that horn? Yes, that was me. <laughs> it wasn't an air horn, brother. I thought it was a vuvuzela. <laughs> that was the Holy no, Spirit. It's so good. We're so glad you guys tuned in today. Uh, check out Trey on all things social media. I'm sure there'll be something there in one of the captions. But man, do us a favor. If this episode ministered to you in any way, let some people know about it. Mm. Share it with some other guys in your life, ladies in your life. We're talking about real things, God's word, life, leadership, culture. We're all trying to get better. We're not just getting older. We are growing up. The best really is yet to come. Find us next time right here on the Mature Me Podcast.